Today, roughly half of all Christians believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth in their lifetime. The book of Revelation contains Jesus Christ's last words to the Christian church about the future. He warns of the terrible events that will fall upon the earth during the tribulation, what will happen to Satan, to the Antichrist, and to all who follow false religion. He tells what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, his second coming to earth, his millennial kingdom, the final judgment, and describes what God has planned for his people in eternity future. In this series, we will take you chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to help you understand its message and the future events God predicts are up ahead. Today, we will continue to examine part three of this series, which we've entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming, and Eternity Future, Revelation chapter 14 through 22. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of Liberty University's School of Religion and Distinguished Professor of Religion and the author of over 40 books. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the author of 30 books on biblical prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. Dr. Ron Rhodes also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries. He's the author of 70 books on prophecy. Join us for this special edition of The John Ackerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're talking about the best news a Christian can ever, ever hear. We're talking about what God says is going to happen when the tribulation is passed, when the millennial kingdom is passed, and we go into eternity future, where we have the new Jerusalem, we have a new heavens and earth created. And we want to talk about that. If you've never heard this before, you just can't miss this program. And uh, we got Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Ron Rhodes with us, as you already have heard. And Ed, I want you to bring us up to speed here of where we're at, how far we've come through Revelation, and uh, what we're going to kind of cover today in this program. All right, John, if you divide Revelation into seven sections, which seems appropriate for the book because it emphasizes the number seven so much. Number one, you have the preface in chapter one, the risen Christ appears to John on the island of Patmos, commissions him to write the book. Number two, you have the proclamation, the letters to the seven churches that Jesus sends to seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century, but that speak to all the churches at all times. Number three, you have the problem that has to be resolved in the book. Somebody worthy to open the scroll, break the seals, pronounce the judgments, and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. The Lamb, Christ, appears. He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy to take the scroll. Then fourthly, you have a process of judgment that follows in chapters 6 through 11, the opening of the seven seals, and then the sounding of the seven trumpets of judgment. That brings us to the midpoint of the book. We'll call it point five. Uh, the players in the great end times drama, seven symbolic players who play a significant role in the time of the end. And then number six, the seven last plagues, the seven bowls of judgment that finally culminate in the return of Christ triumphantly from heaven, uh, the defeat of the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet, the triumph of Christ then as he sets up his millennial kingdom on earth and reigns and rules for a thousand years. And then number seven, you have the postscript and that's really the best part of all the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. That's where we are today. Uh, that place that is so fantastic, it's almost beyond human description. It's a place where there is no curse, there is no sun, no temple, no pain, no death, uh, no tears, and no lost people. It is the abode of the saved forever and ever and ever. It's the eternal city. Yeah, if I could actually put some verses on the screen, and then I want you guys to comment here. We're at the spot where John writes, Jesus giving him the information. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What's the first thing, Mark, that comes to your mind when you hear this passage? Well, I mean, it, it tells us some of the things that are going to be there, but it's also often described as the place of no mores. <laughs> There'll be a lot of things that aren't going to be there. And, and you read those no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. I mean, uh, think about all the, the, the difficulty we have in our lives from pain, people with chronic pain, and we lose loved ones and they die and the tragedy that's in the world. It's going to be as wonderful for the things that aren't there for the things that are there. But the thing that really will make ultimately heaven, heaven, will be the fact that the Lord is there, that we're going to see Him face to face, and it's going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's what will really make heaven, heaven. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about it is that it's a grand reversal. Mm. You know, back in the book of Genesis, we see that paradise was lost due to sin, but in the eternal state, paradise is restored. Back in Genesis, when sin took place, mankind was barred from the tree of life. But once we're in heaven, once we're in the new Jerusalem, we are restored to the tree of life. Back in the book of Genesis, after man sinned, man's bodies died and there was death and mourning and pain. But in the eternal state, there is no more death or pain. And back in Genesis, Satan was very active. But you know what? In the, in the eternal state, he's going to be eternally quarantined, never again to show his ugly face. And so, you know, dozens of examples like that point to the reality that we're going to have a grand reversal and guess what? It never ends. Ed is right. It's a postscript, but it's a postscript that never ends. It just keeps on going. Yeah, I find it interesting that God says he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. We've got a new Jerusalem. Now, this new Jerusalem, I think John ran, ran out of ways to try to describe what he was looking at, mm. okay? I mean, yeah, tell us golden, a little. Well, golden streets that were transparent like glass you could see through. He tries to describe the gates of the city like gigantic pearls. That way, if they're natural, that'd be a huge oyster. Yeah. And God could do that, I suppose. But, uh, and, and the walls are made of precious stones. The other thing that's interesting to me, John, is that the, the gates of the city are named for the 12 tribes of Israel. And yet the foundations of the city are named for the 12 apostles. And what you have in heaven, in eternity, the entire family of God, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, the tribulation and millennial believers, all genuine believers of all time are together in this wonderful place. And you know what else? You know, you mentioned the transparent gold and the jewels all over the city. Try to picture it. The God of glory is the light that lamps up the city. You see, God's glory is something that's magnificent. And if you can imagine that light penetrating the transparent gold wow. and then refracting mm. through the multiple precious stones there. You know, John was using the best language that he could, he could figure out. Yeah. But even what he described is going to be better than that because no mind can even conceive of how great it's going to be. And no eye has seen, no ear has heard. So as good as John did in describing it, it's even better. It's yeah. his challenge of trying to describe the indescribable. That's right. Uh, at times in the book of Revelation. And as best we can understand it in our fallible way of thinking, it's beyond your imagination. It's so wonderful, you don't want to miss this. This heavenly city that, that John describes, it's really a 1,400-mile cube. To me, what I see in this passage, there's, there's two things here. There's a new heaven and a new earth. This present earth and the heavens are taken apart by God and made new. So there's a new earth, there's a new universe. But then the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God and sits on the new earth. It's kind of like the, the metropolis or the capital city, really, of all of eternity. And that, that heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is this big 1,400-mile cube. And some have pointed out that in the, the tabernacle in the wilderness was a 15-foot cube, the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. And in Solomon's temple, it was a 30-foot cube. And here you have this 1,400-mile cube that 
really this, this heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, where God's throne is, where He dwells, is just one huge uh, holy of holies yeah. of where God dwells. And so man excluded from God's presence back in the garden will be brought back into the presence of God, really back to what some have called like an Edenic temple city. It would be like the Garden of Eden and this huge temple city, this huge holy of holies where uh, we fellowship with our Creator. Yeah, and you know, in preliminary to all that, John, the old heavens and the old earth have been destroyed by fire. You got to keep in mind that Satan has been active all over this world and who knows how many demons there are. It's one third of the angelic realm that followed the devil. So you've got their fingerprints all over creation. Mm. So God is going to destroy this planet, the entire universe by fire. All vestiges of Satan will be removed. All vestiges of human sin have been removed and everything will be perfectly designed and recreated for the conditions of the eternal state. Yeah, I love this idea of uh, the New Jerusalem being 1400 miles cubed. Well, if you put that cube, that would take you from say New York out past Colorado. That'd be the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Now go 1400 miles up, okay? And you got rooms in all of this place. I'd like to be 1,400 miles up. Mm -hmm. Now, with our new bodies, it, you're not going to have to wait for the elevator to go 1,400 miles okay. down. Okay. I think you can just think it, and you can be in the lobby where the party's at. Mm -hmm. Or you can travel in this new body of ours in ways we can't even imagine. And you're right about the resurrection body. I like to tell people that we're going to get a body upgrade. And that body upgrade is going to have what I call permaflesh. It never gets old. It never decays. You never have heart problems. You never have kidney problems. Your hair doesn't fall out. It doesn't turn gray. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. And apparently, you can still eat food in the resurrection body. <laughs> Jesus himself ate four times after his physical resurrection from the dead. And scripture tells us that our resurrection bodies will be like his. <laughs> but you'll so. never gain weight. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take a break right here. We come back, we'll talk some more about what's going to be in this new heavens and new earth. You won't want to miss it. Stick with us. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the Book of Revelation, all nine television programs are available on DVD for a gift of $110. This series also comes with our 168-page study guide, and you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. And there's two things, Ed, though, that we need to talk about. First of all, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. The fact is this book is supposed to be preached in the churches. And all of you that are pastors out there, have you preached the book of Revelation to your people? Because Jesus says he wants them to do that. That's the first thing. Comment on that. Well, it's actually his concern and his compassion. He's saying, Here's the message. I've revealed it to you. I've shown you what's going to happen in the future. Trust me and go declare this in the churches. So if a church doesn't preach the book of Revelation, they're not declaring the whole counsel of God, and they're certainly avoiding a major part of the Bible. If 25% of the Bible is prophetic in nature, and this is a prophecy, it says, of itself, this is part of the message that needs to be declared. If we're going to declare the message of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., we need to declare this New Testament book of prophecy as well. It's not just apocalyptic language. It's not just symbolic, uh, cryptic information that's like a puzzle you have to figure out. It defines itself. It was meant for the average person to read it, study it, and understand it. I also don't think they did a two-year study when John got the book back to the mainland, back to the church at Ephesus. I think they read the whole thing through from beginning to end and said, praise God, we win. Yeah. Now, it's supposed to be preached in all of the churches. There's another little thing that uh, there's a warning. The warning is found in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, and it warns readers not to add or take away from God's words 
It says, if anyone adds these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. In other words, I wonder how many preachers, when they do comment on Revelation, change the message or leave out some things like hell or things that we've been talking about. They change it. Yeah, God I warns them, don't, don't do, do it. That. Yeah, I think it's don't make it say more than it says. Don't get wild with crazy speculation, but also don't make it say less than it says. Don't water it down because then you haven't communicated the real message. I think there's also the issue of false prophets, uh, such as in the kingdom of the cults. Now, without mentioning specific cults, I can tell you that there are cults who have retranslated the book of Revelation to support their own teachings. And I can also tell you that there are cults who have inserted things into the book of Revelation and deleted other things from the book of Revelation. Now, based upon this warning, John, I hesitate to think about what those people are going through now who've already died and passed on. Well, and it's just tragic how many people today don't talk about this. And, you know, I think really there's a lot of uh, satanic influence in that in many ways because it's often been said, you know, if you were Satan, would you want people to read a book, you know, that tells about your ultimate doom? So I do think there's, there's satanic influence in that. But to me, I guess the great tragedy I see as a, as a pastor of a church and, and seeing people out there in churches where they never hear the truth of the book of Revelation is in these times in which we live now, we can see these things that the book of Revelation speaks of um, closer on the horizon than any time in church history, yet it's being talked about less. Uh, we need hope now in these days in which we live probably more than any other time in history. And this is the book that gives us that, that ultimate hope. So to me, it's a great tragedy as well, just that this book is not preached faithfully in our churches today. Now, when you first decided to preach on Revelation mm -hmm. and you recognize all of the information, what gave you the courage to start to preach through the book of Revelation? Well, I, be, I became interested in prophecy in my own life uh, back in the early 70s when I was around 12 years old or so when the late great planet Earth came out mm -hmm. and really was interested in it for a while and then for some time really didn't live for the Lord. And when I began to study the Bible again in my early 20s, what I found out is I got in large parts of the Bible and had no idea what I was talking about. And I really started studying prophecy to, to put the pieces of the Bible mm -hmm. together. And it is a daunting task in some ways to study that book. But if we use the basic principles of Bible interpretation that we use in the rest of Scripture, uh, we can come to understand what the book of Revelation means. There are a lot of good commentaries out there uh, that we can read and, and other pastors that we can talk with. And I think we're robbing our people when we don't teach them the book of Revelation. But I think the ultimate person we're robbing is ourselves. Yeah. You were a rock star musician working in Hollywood. <laughs> Prophecy brought you to the Lord. How in the world did you ever have the courage to get up and actually preach this book? Well, you know, one of the things that happened to me after I heard about Bible prophecy is that for the first time in my life, I now believed that the Bible is really the Word of God. After all, only God can tell the future. Nobody else can do that. We have a lot of psychics in our country and in our world, but they can't really tell the future. But this book told the truth. And so for the first time, I believe that it was the Word of God. Now, after that happened, this is kind of strange, but as a young Christian, the one group of books that the Lord put on my heart to read was just a ton of books by Dallas Seminary professors. I don't know why I gravitated to that seminary. I can only say it was God's providence. But I was reading John Wolverd, Dwight Pentecost, Charles Ryrie, all of them. And I had an insatiable hunger to learn more. For the first time in my life, I was alive spiritually. Mm. And that's what put a motivation in my heart to leave showbiz and Hollywood and go to seminary. And I can tell you that it was the right decision. You know, sure, there's not all that glory and fame in Hollywood, but I can tell you, I'd, I'd rather not be doing anything in the world than what I'm doing right now. And, uh, you know, God put it in my heart and I wouldn't trade it for anything. You're the dean of a seminary. So you're teaching kids all the time. Okay. I mean, are there kids that come up to you and say, I could never do what you do in a hundred years. What do you tell them? Well, first of all, I grew up in a home where my parents were both eighth grade dropouts. They never read any books. They never even read the newspaper all the way through. So when the Lord saved me in vacation Bible school as a kid, he 
gave me a love for Jesus, a love for the Bible. I read it all the way through by the time I was 16. Uh, like Ron, I had this insatiable desire to know more and more and more. But uh, what I would tell him is, look, don't avoid the book of Revelation. You don't have to know every single detail in order to get the big picture very, very clear. You should be able to give people a passionate understanding that Jesus is indeed coming again, and you need to be ready to meet him when he comes. Uh, also, I would say, uh, don't get sidetracked on extreme uh, attitudes about certain things in the book. Stay with the main picture. The plain things are the main things in the book, and the book ends with an incredible invitation uh, where Jesus says in chapter 22, verse 17, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who is a thirst, come. Whoever desires, let him come. Uh, the message of the book of Revelation is not meant to frighten us. It's meant to invite us. Come to Christ while there's hope, while there's time. When you read the book of Revelation, it's the Holy Spirit who's tugging at your heart saying, come to Jesus. Uh, it's the bride of Christ, uh, the believers that are saying, come to Jesus. It's Jesus himself who's saying, come to me. That invitation is come to Christ while there's hope, while there's time. All these plagues, all these judgments, all these tragedies don't have to happen to you because the Savior who loves you took the wrath of God against your sin upon himself. And because we know him, we are not appointed unto wrath, but to experience the grace and glory of God. And that's why the book ends, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, the whole book of Revelation is the message of God's grace available to a fallen world. Come to Christ while there's hope, while there's time. Call on him right now. All right. And I'm going to ask you to say a prayer. And all of you that have been listening through this series, maybe you have finally reached the point where you say, I want Jesus in my life. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know if the rapture happens tomorrow, I'm gone, I'm out of here, I'm in heaven. I'm going to be with him for all eternity. And I'd like you to say a prayer. And folks, if you really want to invite the Lord into your life, say along, say the words that Ed says as he says them and mean it. God will look down and he'll hear that prayer. He'll save you. He'll change you. He'll forgive your sins. Ed, lead them in a prayer. The prayer is an expression of your faith in Jesus and what he's done for you on the cross. It's not exactly the right words you say. It's the right heart attitude. But you might pray something like this. Dear God, I really do believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I really believe that he rose from the dead and that he's offering me the gift of eternal life. I want to receive him as my personal savior right now. I'm praying this by faith. I'm praying it in Jesus' name. I'm praying it with the confidence of an amen. And if you do, God will hear you. God will answer. Jesus will save you and he'll give you a brand new life, a life that will last for all eternity in the new heaven, in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem. Yeah. Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And if you prayed that prayer, there's lots of promises that God saved you. Guys, I want to say thank you for coming. I want to say thank you for all the study, for the time, breaking into your busy, busy schedules. And uh, folks, if you'd like to know how to get all the information that they've been teaching you all through these series, stay tuned and we'll tell you about how you can do that right now. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, the last words of Jesus, the book of Revelation. Our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. Our first DVD covers Revelation one through six and is titled, The Glorified Jesus Reveals the Future. Our guests describe Jesus' appearance to John and his commission to him to write the book of Revelation. John then writes letters to the seven churches and is taken up to the throne room of God where he sees Jesus open seven seals that rain down different judgments on earth. 
Our second DVD contains three more programs that cover chapters 7 through 13, which we have titled, The Judgments and Main Players of the Tribulation. Here, we learn about the seven trumpet judgments. As a result of the seal and trumpet judgments, half of the world's population will die. We'll then discover the main players in the tribulation, including a woman, a child, and a dragon who symbolize Israel, Jesus, and Satan. We are told about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Our third DVD is entitled, Armageddon, the Second Coming and Eternity Future, and covers Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Here we learn about the seven horrible bowl judgments and the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will defeat his enemies at his second coming and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. This will be followed by God's final judgment and a description of the new heaven and earth for believers. Today, you may order our entire series on Revelation containing all nine television programs for $110. With this series, we are going to include our 168-page book of Revelation study guide. This new study guide includes extensive notes that parallel our television programs with nine sessions for your personal study or Bible study group. If you'd like to have five or more study guides, they are available for $8 each. Finally, I taped a one-hour question and answer session with our scholars discussing the rapture, the identity of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the coming global government, and much, much more. You may obtain this DVD for a gift of $20. And if you'd like to have all of these materials together, including all nine DVD programs, our new 168-page study guide, plus the one-hour question and answer session, they are available together in a special package for only $125. You may order the special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. We may also order these materials at jashow.org. Thank you.